Good afternoon. Welcome to the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies and the Center for the Study of International Migration. Uh, we are delighted to welcome you today to discuss the migration development regime, how class shapes Indian emigration by Rina Agarwala. Uh, the timing is fortuitous. We just learned this week that she was awarded the Thomasons Nanietsky Best Book Award from the International Migration Section of the American Sociological Association. So congratulations, uh, Rina, for that well-justified accomplishment. Um, today we have as a discussant, uh, Rohan uh, Advani, who is a doctoral candidate in sociology at UCLA. Our order of business is that uh, first, Rena will give about a 25 to 30 minute overview of the book. We'll then have a comment of about 10 minutes by Rohan, kick it back to Rena for a brief response and then open it up for discussion. Uh, so without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Rena. Hey, so thank you. Thank you so much, David and Roger, for inviting me. And thank you, Rohan, for reading it and reading the book and engaging um, with it. Really looking forward to the comments. So one of the purposes of my book is to shift the discussions from looking mainly at receiving countries to also looking at sending countries. Obviously, migration is a global phenomenon. But also, I argue that if we um, miss out on sending countries, or if we don't include sending countries, we miss out on a big part of migrants' identity. But we also inadvertently depict sending countries as sort of passive agents that simply respond to receiving country demands. And in reality, um, as I show in the book, sending countries have a long history of not just responding to receiving country labor demands, which of course is very important, but also proactively controlling who leaves and does not leave the country. Um, so in the book, I trace how and why the Indian state has managed out migration or emigration from India to the Middle East and the US across classes from the 1800s to the present. And one of the moments that really stunned me early on in my research was when I was speaking with a government official in charge of migration in India. And he kept talking about two different kinds of passports, the ECR and the ECNR. He kept saying this over and over again. I could not understand what he was saying. And then finally, I learned that since the early 1900s and still today, India has enacted different laws, different regulations, and essentially different passports for poor, low skill migrants versus elite high skill migrants. And this was surprising in a democratic context like India that at least purports to provide equal rights to all citizens. But when it comes to the right to mobility, I learned that until it, the 1980s, poor migrants um, were actually forbidden, explicitly under law forbidden to leave India, while elite migrants were free to go. And still today, poor migrants are subjected to a battery of regulations, restrictions, fees, and paperwork when elite migrants have none of that. And this is enshrined in law. The measure used is just a very stark number of years of education. Those with more than 10 years are deemed elite, and those with less than 10 years are deemed poor. And I didn't know this, uh, and I've been studying Indian labor for over 20 years. Almost no one that I had met who's in the sort of elite or professional educated category knew this. And to me, that meant that all this has been happening without any public discussion, any debate, or even knowledge. And so that got me thinking, how or why would the Indian state bother to manage their migrants by class? It's not very easy. It's costly. It's hugely inefficient. Um, and how do the different classes then react to these differential regulations? And how has that state migration relationship changed over time? So I first turned to the global migration literature, and that's where I found much of it focused on receiving countries, even in the context of India, which is this middle picture here, where India is also a receiving country. And a lot of the global migration literature in India focuses on that aspect of India's migration. And within receiving countries, people's protests against or for migration are usually depicted as a flashpoint for states, receiving states to manage. Um, as we know, it's very much in the news. Um, the Atlantic has said it's the biggest wedge in American politics. The Guardian has said it's the greatest challenge European leaders face. 
And this has bred what Jim Hollifield has famously called the migration state, or a state that has the sole right to manage migrants. Um, so this made me wonder, do sending states also have migration states? Um, do they also hold this uncontested right to manage who does and who doesn't leave their country? Um, Second, I was uh, struck by the fact that the, all these tensions that are depicted or analyzed in receiving countries around migration always highlight the racial or ethnic angle, but the class dynamic of migration is less often mentioned. And again, this was surprising to me because actually we are facing more class diversity among migrants today than ever before. And second, the resistance or the racism around migration, especially in the global north, tends to quell around low skill migrants, leaving high skill migrants unscathed or sometimes even celebrated. And finally, although international norms prohibit the migration states of receiving countries from overtly discriminating and controlling immigrants by race, although we all know that happens, we have to do, we know also know it's done in sort of backhanded ways through the country quotas, et cetera. In contrast to that, receiving countries, almost every receiving country in the world has an uncontested right to officially and legally control immigrants by class. And that is very um, rarely contested. So this made me wonder, how are sending countries handling the multiple classes of their out migrants and immigrants? Um, so I, my book looks at the case of India. India is surprisingly um, absent or at least uh, less discussed in much of the global discussions on migration, especially those discussions that look at emigrant states. Um, and this is surprising because India is actually, sorry, I'm just, for some, sorry, it's, did my presentation just go away? It's stuck on the India slide. Okay, I'm trying to, it's the largest migrant exporter in the world. It's the largest remittance receiving country in the world. Um, in 2022, India earned 100 billion US dollars from its migrants abroad. That far exceeds what India earns from its very well-known software exports, for example. And it's also the most class diverse migration stream in the world. And the class diversity of Indian migrants is quite puzzling. Um, on one hand, it's poor migrants are actually the vast majority of the source of those massive remittances flowing into India. Yet the state provides very little recognition, celebration, or welfare of these migrants. And this does stand in contrast to what the Philippine state, the Mexican state, and even the Chinese state has done in recent years. In contrast, India's very large and very elite, elite migrant group actually has been found to show relatively low levels of foreign direct investment remittances and their foreign portfolio investments. Um, and again, this is in stark contrast to, for example, Chinese elite migrants abroad. Yet the Indian state in recent years has really invested in celebrating and awarding and recognizing and even building new relations with these elite immigrants abroad. So that of course raises the obvious question, what in the world is the Indian state receiving from these elite migrants if it's not financial uh, returns? Um, so for the book I looked, I did an archival analysis of government migration documents from the 1920s to uh, 2020. Then I did a bunch of interviews with state officials at the national level and the subnational level. I looked at recruiters and then I looked at two, both these classes of migrants. And just I want to say a few quick words about the context of these two groups of migrants. So for the poor migrants, I did look at the Gulf uh, migrants, the migrants going in the Gulf that began largely in the mid 1970s as a result of the huge surge in labor demand in the Gulf of the oil rich Gulf countries. Um, these are the vast majority of them, not all, but the vast majority of them are deemed poor or unskilled and are subjected to those batteries of regulations, therefore. But because of the migration regime on the Gulf end, they're also made almost entirely given temporary visas, um, which means they have to migrate without their families. 
And when they return to India, they've been found to oh, most of them uh, face unemployment upon return, and therefore they're often sort of pitted into these um, circular streams of migration back and forth. This group is required by law to go through a recruiter, which elite migrants do not have to go through. And because a lot of the social organizations are forbidden on the Gulf end, they have formed what are called returnee organizations back on the India side. And that is the group that I, or sort of the lens through which I tapped into these poor migrants. For the uh, elite migrants, I looked at a Indian immigrants in the US and I compiled a new database of about over 620 organizations, all of which have been formed to create a bridge or a bond within, uh, between those in the US and back home in India. And I want to say two quick things about these Indian Americans that is important for their relationship to India. The first is that they're relatively new. 44% of them arrived after 2010. And second, compared to other ethnic groups, they're much less naturalized. We hear a lot about how they have taken up the vast share of the H-1B visas, and 21% of them are actually here as international students. And this is relevant because it means that their bonds back to India are quite fresh. They're also extremely elite. Over 80% of them in the US have a college degree, a college graduate degree, I should say, and their median household income is 150,000. That's again, far and above what uh, most of the ethnic groups in the US have. Okay, so let me turn to some of my arguments in the book. So my starting question again was why would the Indian state go through such pains to control the mobility of their citizens by class? And a key argument I make in the book is that we need to reframe our examination of emigration practices and perhaps also immigration practices and policies as a regime. And I define the regime as a set of regularities and practices that enable various aspects of sending country development. So in other words, I'm trying to connect the fact that out migration has a huge impact on internal development back in the sending country as well. And a key actor in this regime is the sending state that were the migration state that uses, I argue, emigration as a proactive vector to shape the, in, in this case, the Indian economy, to secure its own political legitimacy, both within India and also globally. And finally, to attain consent, especially within India, for a particular development ideology. And by that, I mean particular habits, norms, and institutions. Um, so in other words, I'm sort of trying to project migration to be viewed similarly to how we think about education and media as a vector through which we can establish consent, especially among elites. And the advantage of the MDR framework, I argue, is that it highlights the multiple pressures that a migration state faces, both from above and from below. So from below, of course, the Indian state is facing multiple different pressures from its different subnational governments. It is a federalist system, and I looked at three different subnational governments in the book, as well as from its different classes of migrants. But at the same time, it's dealing with all the global forces, such as employer demand, the receiving country's immigration policies, and northern development ideologies. So although in retrospect, the MDR might seem like it's what rational, in the book, what I argue is that it's only in part rational, mostly it's contradictory, it's contingent, and therefore it's a site of struggle that changes over time. And that change is what I trace in the book. And I sort of depict or trace India, the rise and fall of India's MDRs over time from the 1800s to the present. And I argue that um, broadly speaking, India can be categorized as having three different MDRs since the 1800s. The first I call the Cooley MDR, which began in 1834, which was just after the British outlawed um, slavery from Africa and then turned to indentured servitude from India. The next is the Nationalist MDR, which began in 1947 when India gained independence to the late 70s. 
And the third is what I call the CEO MDR, or the MDR where everyone can be a CEO, whether you're a poor migrant or an elite migrant. And that began in 1977 to the present. And I want to emphasize the beginning of the CEO MDR in 1977 is striking because in India, officially, liberalization was launched in 1991. And so one of the arguments I'm trying to make in the book is that actually this the liberalization of migration in India, in fact, started before the liberalization of goods and services. So over time, in some moments, emigrants consent to a particular MDR, and in other moments, they resist the emigration practices, cause the fall of a particular MDR, and bring an opportunity to rise a new MDR. And at certain moments, MDRs reflect a dominant economic ideology, but at other times, it changes that ideology. So for example, the Cooley MDR could be seen as quite reflective of the norms and values instituted under colonialism, but the nationalist MDR, which prohibited the movement of people, helped cement consent for the subsequent development ideology, which in India is known as Fabian socialism, that also closed the borders to goods and services. Similarly, the CEO MDR, as I said, which began in the late 70s, not in 1991, gradually liberalized the movement of people, which helped gain consent within India for the gradual liberalization of goods and services. So in other words, I'm arguing that the movement of people across borders has often served as a taste test for sending countries, in this case, India, desires to control or not or restrict the movement of goods and services across borders, which is which constitutes sort of a basis of the development ideologies. Now, across all three of these MDRs, there have also been some continuities. All three of India's MDRs have served as a vector to spread particular knowledge, ideologies, and practices. This includes sort of anti-imperial norms, anti-racist norms, pro-democracy norms, and more um, recently, norms and aspirations around global capitalism. Second, all three have accentuated and legitimized class inequities within India across time. And finally, until recently at least, all of the MDRs have fomented a cross-class resistance that has ultimately caused one MDR to fall and a new MDR to rise. So in my closing chapter, I sort of offer some conjectures of what might we expect uh, in our near future. Might we see some kind of a cross-class um, resistance to the CEO MDR? But let me just quickly go through some of the discontinuities or some of the things that make each of these MDRs rather unique. Um, starting with the Cooley MDR, this was the MDR that first exported poor and elite labor as what I call racialized coolies for the empire. This was sort of the starting point of a migration state that um, formed to use migration as a vector for uh, internal accumulation, but it was also the first MDR to institute class-based migration laws and institutions, all of which are still present today, down to the name of the officers, the name of the offices, those laws, et cetera, with some minor reforms since then. Eventually, however, this did foment a cross-class uh, anti-racial and anti-imperial movement that did cause its demise and made room for the new MDR, the nationalist MDR, to emerge. And it was under this MDR that the Indian state uh, chose to forbid poor migrants from emigrating while allowing elite emigrants to leave its borders. And when we look through the sort of parliamentary debates during this period in the archives, you see that a lot of it was justified by saying they want to protect their domestic image as a protector. This is the post-colonial state is promising to uphold its, its call to protect vulnerable labor, but also showcase this new um, sort of image as a creator of skilled labor. 
And so there's all these quotes from the archive saying, we will not be a coolie nation, but we actually have so much surplus skilled labor that we can even get rid of some of it. We don't need them. Um, and this created what I call a notion of paternalist protection, again, something that is still present to this day for the poor. Um, in the name of protection, there is this sort of uh, paternalist control over poor people's mobility. And in order to justify the disjuncture towards their actions to elites, the Indian state sort of turned a cold shoulder to elite immigrants and essentially did not discuss them. Now, this eventually fell because it created an illegal and dangerous market for poor migrants. I spoke to so many recruiters who had pictures of these wooden boats that they used to use to sort of take poor migrants, smuggle them past surveillance technologies and all sorts of things that the government had put into place just to get some very, very low wage jobs in the Gulf during this surge in labor demand. Um, there was some discussions also about the brain drain of elites, but really the fall of this MDR is due to a massive resistance movement that took place by poor migrants. And that's something that I think is important to remember as we think about the solid basis for the current liberalization of migration. The call for liberalizing immigration came from India's poorest workers. And so that brings me to the CEO MDR. And let me just quickly go through a couple things that are quite unique about the CEO MDR compared to the previous MDRs. First of all, the CEO MDR has tried to tap immigrants' financial contributions to India for the first time. I already mentioned its massive financial remittances that they have earned from poor migrants. Um, this has, of course, been a major success. But the Indian state also tried to tap other forms of financial remittances, especially from its elite migrants, by appealing to their ethnic and racial bonds to India and offer them, offering them financial privileges that were not available to Indian elites or to foreigners. Um, so they created this particular category of Indian migrants or emigrants, especially elite ones, that would attain certain market privileges for a particular battery of products. Um, and so all of these products essentially used a, a tax category called NRI that had existed earlier from the 60s, but had laid dormant. So I talked to a lot of Indian Americans, for example, who said NRI, we used to say it stood for non-required Indian, because of course in the Fabian socialist era, they turned a cold shoulder towards these immigrants. It was resuscitated, however, during the CEO MDR, and it really means non-resident Indian. And so through, through these NRI packages only um, al allowed for elite immigrants, um, the Indian state created what is known, uh, I didn't come up with this term, but I think it's a beautiful term, not foreign direct investment, but ethnic direct investment. Um, particular savings packages, again, only for NRIs and particular bonds only for NRIs that received market um, return, above market returns. And despite all of the efforts put into this, all of these have turned out to not only be quite costly for the state, they've been very volatile because one of the things that they had to institute in order to attract the elite migrants to even invest in these packages was the right to pull out whenever they want. So they've been very volatile according to um, global cycles and ultimately rather low. So this brings us back to the original question, what then does the Indian state gain from these elite migrants? Why have they invested so much in celebrating them, creating awards, building new relations? And here I argue that the uh, second aspect of the CEO MDR that's quite unique is that the Indian state has tapped another unique resource from elite immigrants for the first time. And that is what I call ideological remittances. Indian Americans have helped elites in India embrace and practice rather than critique new development ideals of privatization, volunteerism, self-sufficiency, and entrepreneurship. Um, and in, to attract these ideological remittances under the CEO MDR, the Indian Americans have been in, sort of allowed to form partnerships with Indian business elites, as well as with Indian elite government officials, 
And in doing so, well, I should say in the book, I talk about, I sort of trace these elite partnerships in private education, healthcare, private philanthropy, um, which has resulted in new tax codes for, um, for philanthropy, and private business development. And in the process, I argue that Indian Americans have helped reshape Indian businesses, Indian voluntary sector, India's real estate markets, and Indian policy. And in return for this sort of ideological and technological assistance, the Indian state has offered much greater recognition of Indian Americans. In fact, they have framed Indian Americans as the ideal type of elite global Indian. This is the, per, the, the sort of image of the successful, hardworking, private sector professional and entrepreneur who all domestic Indians should also emulate. So unlike in the earlier MDRs, the CEO MDR, I argue, empowers Indian Americans to help shape India's future and simultaneously valorize their own status within the US. So let me just conclude with a quick appeal on that note to the future. So as I mentioned uh, in my book, I talk about, um, I sort of end the book with this question of what's next. If history is our guide, the CEO MDR should fall at some point. And the question is how and why. Um, so in this conclusion, I note that embedded in the CEO MDR, as with all the MDRs before it, are a number of tensions. Um, and I detail that in the conclusion. But if history is any guide to the future, we may see some resistance by emigrants to that current MDR. And if elite emigrants can use their status and stature within the US and in India to join forces with poor emigrants to fight for greater rights and greater recognition for all migrants, I think we may be able to push India into a new MDR that I hope we can call a humane MDR. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rina. Uh, Rohan. Great, hi. Thanks uh, so much for that. So, I mean, I just want to begin with just stating how much of a pleasure it was reading this book. It's really an impressive book. And as someone who's not a scholar of migration, I felt somewhat nervous being a discussant, but it soon became clear to me it's invaluable, not only for scholars of migration, but also for political economists, sociologists of development, social movements, and labor. And in a sense, the book's a modern history of Indian capitalism and development told through the story of Indian emigration. It draws on historical records, data sets, interviews to chart a more than 100 year history of Indian emigration to detail the relationship between Indian migrants and the Indian state and examine the central importance of class in undergirding this relationship. And while the ambitious nature of the book is laudable in and of itself, I think it delivers on what it sets out to do. And I hope that it'll inspire scholars of migration to take seriously historical approaches to migration in order to see you know, what things are really new, what has stayed the same, and then to explain both continuity and change. Now, as Rina has gone over in her presentation, there are important contributions to scholarship on migration, Indian development. You know, the book decenters northern development ideologies and reinscribes global South countries with agency, albeit conditioned by structural imbalances in the global economy. It examines pre neoliberal migration regimes or, or migration over the long durée. And it makes a claim that I've never come across before, which is that the liberalization of emigration may have actually anticipated economic liberalization in India. And it provides an actually detailed account of how elite emigrants are not only used to generate consent for India's new developmental strategy, but also how they often function as cultural brokers of neoliberal norms. So, so much of what we think of as almost cultural imperialism might actually be a sort of diaspora led one. Um, but rather than reiterate these points, I want to instead kind of focus on some of the stories that are little, a little less visible and kind of bring to them to the fore. And then maybe I'd like to push Rina a little bit more on them. So 
First is the issue of class. I mean, I think the book does a wonderful job demonstrating how class inequalities have shaped the history of Indian emigration. Um, and as the book notes, Indian emigration has always been a dual process with one set of rules and dynamics for elites and another for the working poor. The book also hints at the opposite, that migration, of course, shapes class. In fact, the book is explicit about how class inequalities are accentuated by, by migration. But I think we could push this even more. And maybe I think the book also demonstrates that the state regulation of emigration is actually a process of class formation. So this comes in different forms. So for example, during the nationalist and CEO MDR, it's the developmentalist legacy of elite public institutions, like your IITs, right? Coupled with the lax emigration for credentialed or elite labor that function not only as a subsidy for you know, Western corporations, but really the creation of a professional managerial class in the West, right? Because labor is being, skilled, is being trained for free in India, these costs are not borne by Western employers. And it's actually this creation of a, of a PMC, right? Um, on the working class side, you know, we know that working classes have to be made cheap and vulnerable. They don't exist as such. And we have a large literature showing how this happens on the receiving side. But I think the paternalistic characteristics of the Indian state shows that this is happening on the sending side as well. And then um, the book also demonstrates that migration creates contradictory class locations. So returnee migrants who come back, they often have enough capital for consumption investment, um, unlike domestic workers, but they don't have the same sort of maybe cultural or social capital as their elite counterparts. They also often return and have difficulty finding employment. And in that sense, they're marginalized in a double sense from both organized labor in receiving countries as well as in sending countries. And so it creates these sort of um, ambiguous or contradictory classes. Um, another thing is that I think the book tells a complex story of the Indian state um, its failures and issues of state capacity. So throughout the book, we're witness to the deficiencies of the Indian state. It can't control the outflow of its elites, uh, even though Indian industrialization in the mid 20th century was relatively more capital intensive or wanted to be than let's say East Asian states. Um, it repeatedly fails to garner steady investments from its elite diaspora. It relies on private recruiters, it often cannot or chooses not to provide welfare to its poorer returnees. Now, maybe you don't see this as an issue of failure, but I think there's a way to read it as a lack of state capacity. For example, even when the Indian state is able to reap the financial benefits of its poorer working classes through remittances, I mean, it might just be because it's actually administratively easier to do so than to court investment from elite classes. Nonetheless, right, we know that the class outcomes um, are, are very different. So I just wonder whether this is, you know, the different ways in which poor and elite immigrants are relating to the Indian state. Is that just a reflection of capitalist dynamics, right? Or is it also a problem of Indian state capacity that can neither extract from its elites, nor can it provide for its poor? Um, then, I think there also seems to be another story about uh, state and federal relations in India, as seen through the case of emigration. So the book frames the MDR as kind of a nationally scale regime, from what I understand. Yet a lot of the dynamics seem to be driven by state level concerns or subnational concerns. For example, the victories of the Left Democratic Front in Kerala caused capital flight, which encouraged emigration as a way of securing employment for Keralites, even though this is discouraged at the federal level, uh, or the national level, sorry. It's not until the Indian federal government's balance of payments crisis emerges in the 80s, do they begin to really care. Similarly, the Indian federal government refuses to provide welfare for returning immigrants, and it's a cost that is shouldered by the Kerala state government. On the flip side, and I, and I know you have a couple of pages about Gujarat, but it seems that on the whole, it's Indian 
um, national level institutions that are invested in courting ideas, norms, and capital from elite immigrants. Um, even during the nationalist MDR, it is Indian leaders at the federal level who seem to be deeply concerned with India not being seen as a coolie nation, right? Like why the Indian state did not allow um, uh, its poor workers to leave, but let its elite ones do so is a genuine puzzle from a purely materialist standpoint. Um, and I just don't know if um, notions of global image or ambitions to be a global superpower are they as relevant to politicians at the subnational level? So more generally, right, given that international migration is often something that's regulated through federal agencies, could you maybe say more about the tensions between um, federal and national governments and how this pertains to the question of class? And then last, you know, I appreciated the conclusion, especially as like a call to action, even if maybe I'm more pessimistic than you. But um, I just want to poke a little bit at the argument about how elite immigrants can play a role in generating social change and the need to focus on class-based inequalities to enshrine a new and more humane rights-based MDR. Now, I totally agree with you about the what is to be done question, right? Making elite immigrants more class conscious in their forms of political mobilization. But your arguments for the Cooley and nationalist MDR uh, and why they fell apart seem to suggest that it is often non-class or contingent events that best help mobilize elite immigrants into change. In the Cooley MDR, there's an argument about how an anti-colonial movement is motivated by anti-racist and then nationally oriented concerns, which in turn brings down the Cooley MDR. In the nationalist MDR chapter, we have the convergence of poor and elite immigrants mobilizing against the Congress government and subsequently the end of the nationalist MDR because of a pro-democracy movement. In other words, you call for a movement that is attuned to class-based inequalities, but your historical narrative indicates that it is actually contingent or non-class events that spark progressive mobilization. Now, I don't mean to suggest that we wait around for some sort of deus ex machina, but I do wonder whether it's actually a non-class movement that would lead to the end of the current MDR, whether this be national, environmental, religious, or geopolitical. Um, so yeah, so I hope that some of those points are coherent and um, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on them. Um, yeah, but again, Fantastic book, everyone should read it. Uh, it's, it's, it's really uh, very impressive. Thank you, uh, Rohan. Rina, would you like to take a few minutes to respond to those questions before we open it up to the audience? Yes, Rohan, thank you so much. These are amazing, I love them. Um, very thought provoking. I'm gonna take the second one first just because it's an easier, quicker one. Um, and then I'll do number three and end with number one. Um, Okay, so the tensions between national and subnational MDR. So my original dream for the book when I began was that I'm going to showcase the national MDR and then I'm going to showcase three subnational MDRs. Um, as you can imagine, it, I, I had to stop because I was just going on and on and on as it is. This took me longer than I can admit. So it I I basically stopped short of really unpacking the state level MDRs. I'm now actually involved in a project where we're going to do an edited volume and really unpack some of the subnational MDRs. And what the word tension is exactly the right word to use because what I was trying to show is that we have multiple MDRs in an ideal world, I'd also love to show India's MDRs a receiving country, which is in tension with its MDR as a sending country. And then you have all these subnational MDRs that are contradictory because they each are dealing with a different subclass dynamic. So the Kerala, let's just start with Kerala. The Kerala subnational MDR is was a movement that actually where the poor migrants came together as an organized movement pushed its subnational MDR to liberalize the the nationalist um, board the restricted borders let's say 
And because Kerala cared much less about its non coolie image and much more about its democratic electoral image within the state, the Kerala state government pushed the national government to liberalize its borders. So that's just one example of where the nationalist MDR had to respond to a subnational one. Gujarat provides a really nice model of where the nationalist MDR again succumb to the way a subnational MDR was operating and that's on the elite immigrant side. So in for example, I, you know, I couldn't go into all of the details in the book, but Gujarat actually has not just an NRI, which is non-resident Indian card, they have an NRG card, a non-resident Gujarati card, where non-resident Gujaratis can get discounts on all the Gujarati businesses across the world. I mean, they are masters at creating that global identity, not at the India level, but at that subnational level of Gujarati ethnicity. And it's no coincidence for those who know Indian politics, the that MDR that was in power under the BJP and Modi is now in power at the national level. So um, I, it's, it's a very important point. It's only touched upon in the book. And it's sort of one of those things that I hope to do post book. But I would love a world where we start looking at MDRs in receiving countries, in sending countries, and at the subnational levels. Um, okay, on the third question of what's to come, um, so I like how you put it that non-class um, issues are what sort of catalyzed a cross-class movement. Um, and yes, for the fall of the COMDR, there was an imperialist movement. For the fall of the nationalist movement, there was a pro-democracy movement. What I want to, uh, what I, I, I'm sort of... Um, speculating is that the next sort of impetus that's going to happen to push the two classes together is insecurity. And that is actually my next project, because what used to be a clear divide between poor migrants who were trapped in temporary migration streams did not hold for elite migrants who actually received permanent resident status. What's happening much more now, as I showed in some of those figures, is that even skilled, high-skilled elite migrants are only allowed to go on temporary visas. And you, you know, I was just in India in January, and it was newspapers were just filled with these stories of tens of thousands of Indians in the U.S. were being laid off with Amazon and all of those layoffs that we've heard about, and they're having to, they have 60 days to get a job or they're kicked out of the country. So that level of insecurity is now even hitting the elites and the high skill, and skill was supposed to be their sort of ace card against insecurity. And so my, my speculation or my hypothesis is that this sort of drive of insecurity is what might push together a, um, a cross-class movement. Okay, and then quickly on your last question, I think you're absolutely right. There's a lack, there could be elements of lack of state capacity. That's true for anything in India. Um, I. I think, I guess I would just argue that that is more the go-to explanation when it comes to migration. It's also the Indian state's argument, by the way. The Indian state will always say, we're not involved in migration. We, we're not able to control that. People are free to do whatever they want. They will not make a national policy on immigration. They don't discuss it. It doesn't enter any kind of political discussions. And what I'm trying to sort of put forth is there's a little bit more deliberate activity than meets the eye. Thank you very much. Let's open it up to discussion. Um, if anyone has a question, feel free to electronically raise your hand to, to get us going. You know, I have a question about the the coolie regime and there are various places in the text where you, where you refer to china but i'm especially interested in the extent to which the chinese coolie regime was a model or an iterative model with the indian coolie regime given that it was the british government that was organizing both of those uh, whether it was from india or or from hong kong uh, so do you see elements of policy transfer, diffusion, or even a more centralized um, operation of that regime in the 19th century? And then the second question is, to what extent are Indian policymakers looking at Chinese policy vis-a-vis -vis emigrants 
in formulating their own contemporary policies? Hmm. Well, it's I have to on the on the Cooley regime, I have to plead ignorance. I really did not come across um, sort of notions that the British government was in any way learning from their experiences in Hong Kong and applying that in India, or even that there was a connection. That's not to say it doesn't exist. I just was not aware of that. So I would love to hear more about that. Um, and mo much of my chapters on the Cooley regime is of course drawing from historians who studied that era, mainly from the Indian perspective. Um, that's entirely different from the contemporary moment though. So in the contemporary era, there's a lot of comparisons made with China, um, in large part because of the geopolitical tensions that are also taking place um, between India and China, as well as this sort of rat race of, which is a non-comparable rat race at this point. But at one point there was this uh, sort of notion that which who's gonna be the, the giant. And in the beginning, when India first started its sort of efforts to, tap into Indian elites, um, their financial remittances and create some kind of status recognition and all of that. A lot of those efforts were made having looked at the Chinese model. So there was a lot of talk of China's boom really being sparked by its overseas Chinese diaspora and the Chinese states, the very capable Chinese states ability to tap that diaspora. And that was a role model that was explicitly used by Indians. Now, fast forward to this day, India is nowhere near where China is in terms of managing its diaspora. And I'm not an expert, but just looking at Min Zhou's work, you can see the Chinese government, for example, I've been told has a directory of all the Chinese American transnational organizations that exist in, in, in the US and it keeps it updated. Indian, the Indian government has no such thing. I had to make it from scratch. And still today they're saying, oh, can we have your database? I'm like, yeah, sure, but you have to update it. I mean, and so to Rohan's point again, absolutely there's a capacity issue, but at the same time, there's a choice issue of where you want to uh, sort of strengthen your capacity or um, occlude or make your capacity more opaque and lean on that capacity, incapacity crunch. And in the field of migration, they have occluded their capacity, definitely not invested in their capacity. And the effect of that has been a massive um, class differential. So I would say in short, David, that I see more of the use or the um, role modeling of the Chinese experience on the elite migrant side. I can't say I know enough about what they have done on the poor migrant side, historically. Thank you. Um, let's go to uh, Suzanne Modal, followed by Jennifer Chun. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, that, thank you, that was a, a really interesting talk. Um, my interest is a little bit marginal, but I'm thinking you're an expert and perhaps you can help me. Uh, I'm interested in the relationship between class and in India, class of emigrants from India to other to destinations globally. Uh, so you focus on the U.S. and you tell us that, and we know there's a very, very high, the Indians are the highest, uh, most educated group with the possible exception of the Taiwanese. Um, and uh, obviously it's working class, poor people that are going to uh, the Gulf states. But there are a lot of other destinations that Indians go to. Uh, they certainly have a long presence in the UK, uh, but also uh, other English speaking destinations and also uh, other places in Asia, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, uh, and, uh, and also in Europe. I, I think Germany is maybe one of their preferred destinations. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, what set of classes or particular class might be going to some of these other destinations? Sure. Do you want me to collect questions or answer each other? Why, why don't you go ahead and just answer them serially for now? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So thanks for the question. I, I did um, focus in on these two sets primarily because they were 
they sort of exemplified the two classes. So I didn't pick them for their receiving country status, but I picked them based on the class. So the vast majority of migrants coming to the US uh, are elite, the vast majority of Indian migrants going to the Gulf are, are, are poor, although as people have written, there is a sizable portion of elite migrants there too. Um, I do not, again, I'm not an expert on the Indian migration stream in the UK. Um, I hope someone writes a book about, about the UK and, and India's um, MDR with regard to the M UK, because the UK, because of its history, is much more muddled in class terms. Um, it's a longer history, it's more muddled. I did happen to write an op-ed just because uh, Rishi, when Rishi Sunak became uh, Prime Minister, I had to write that op-ed in the Washington Post because it was just too good to be true because his own personal story just fit my MDR so perfectly. I mean, his his grandfather sort of was sent over um, during the Cooley MDR, which, by the way, did not only send over, I, as I mentioned in the presentation, it sent over elite and poor coolies. So you sent the poor coolies, but then you sent a class of managers, essentially, of Indians who could uh, manage the accounts, the laws, and, and also literally manage the coolies. That, one of those was um, Rishi Sunak's grandfather. And then um, during the Nationalist MDR, his parents um, both moved to England. And then during the CEO MDR, not only does he become C uh, prime minister of the UK, but he also marries um, the daughter of India's sort of a, a billionaire CEO of uh, an Indian IT company, which is sort of the illustration of what I call in the book, the elite pact. And so that's the argument I'm making with these elite partnerships is that what the CEO MDR is forging are these elite pacts between these different countries. So the UK is definitely one of those countries um, where it has not only the poor stream, but also the elite stream. Many countries in Africa um, and Singapore as well. I would say Germany is an interesting case. Again, I'm not an expert, but just anecdotally, Germany itself really tried to tap into Indian elite migrants um, and to sort of draw them over. And they haven't been as successful as they had hoped, in large part because, and I think others have written very nice works on this, that this sort of stream or the enclaves had already started with the US. And when I spoke with the um, Indian government officials who were sort of really working on building these bridges with its emigrants, People said to me, very officials told me very, very overtly, look, we're doing all of this. We created a ministry for overseas Indian affairs, all of this, mainly to tap the Americans, the Indians in the US, that's what we want. And then they created all these awards, et cetera. It was only later they added in an award for you know, a manual laborer or an award that would fit some of these other receiving countries. It's really the US that became the apple of their eye. Um, and, and I should also say back to Rohan, you know, to your point on um, capacity versus deliberation. I mean, I start the book with that quote, the quote that says, you know, look, we're, we don't want these uh, elite people. It's a big misconception that we want their money. We don't want their money. He literally was in charge of building bridges with the elites. And this is another tension that is forming. On one hand, the Indian government has to build this bridge with the elites because they benefit greatly from it. On the other hand, that post-colonial mentality of not being subjected to the North or the in Indian terms, the West, um, is still quite deeply rooted. And so there is that tension and that comes out very clearly also with the UK, obviously. Uh, um, Jennifer. Hi, thanks for that wonderful talk. And also um, this fantastic book, I think you really, um, are um, you know showing us how important it is to look at uh, the role of emigration and um, and and a, a sort of a class centered understanding of of emigration and um, and states in particular. I um, I'm curious um, when I think about um, kind of one of the central debates 
uh, in kind of the immigration literature, it's about how gender is really shaping kind of uh, migration flows. And I think about sort of the, the classic uh, book on Kerala by Shiva George, When Women Come First, uh, and Pierre Handagnus Atello's work on sort of the gender dimensions of migration. So as you know, one of the leading scholars of gender, labor, and in, in, informal uh, work, I'm curious um, how you think uh, gender is really shaping variation in any of these MDRs, or um, you know, how the state um, is thinking about sort of gendered emigration flows. And if there isn't really any attention to it, how do you make sense of that for kind of the core questions that you're interested in around sort of um, generating consent for development ideologies or securing political legitimacy or even sort of shaping the, the class-based sort of character of, of, uh, of the political economy. Okay, I'm so glad you brought up gender. So gender is another one of those sort of um, topics that I, I discovered during the process of this research and just couldn't get into enough because the book had to end and is something I'm now um, working on. So gender is just so fascinating in India's MDR. So I, I've said multiple times that the Indian law on immigration has created this sort of very clear divide um, based on this very easy metric of number of school years of education. If you have above a certain number, you're kind of free, you're deemed elite, you're deemed high skill. If you have below that number, you're deemed poor, you need protection, you're vulnerable, and it has, that has manifested itself in a type of control, a government control. Now, all of that falls to the wayside when you intersect it with gender. Um, and so, for example, even highly educated female nurses going to these countries in the Gulf are subjected to the same regulations that poor unskilled workers are subjected to. Um, secondly, even poor unskilled female workers are actually still forbidden from going. So they can't even go through the recruiters and the regulations and the certification, et cetera. They're actually forbidden from going. Now we all know they go. Um, so I would be talking to recruiters. We'd be sitting at their desk talking and he, and he will just openly say to me, oh no, no, we don't work with women. You know, that's illegal. We don't send women, uh, unskilled women to the Gulf. And he would have stacks of papers with pictures of applications of women applica applicants. Um, so what that has done essentially has just pushed women even further into this very, very hidden abode where they are absolutely made even more vulnerable, again, completely in the name of protection. And so Margaret Walton Roberts has written beautiful stuff actually on how nurses, for example, go from Kerala to the Gulf and come back and are, are sort of um, punished on the marriage market. So rather than having this non coolie image, there's also a sub image that the Indian state, as well as subnational states, by the way, as well as at the society level, are very, very defensive about. And that is this image of protecting our women and keeping them pure. And so the notion that these even skilled women are going abroad and touching other men's bodies, or especially foreign men's bodies, has um, demoted them on the marriage market when they return home. So there's so many fantastic gender elements that need to be further explored. Some of them are enshrined in law and very overt, and some of them are just played out in these social settings. We have a question from... Jechi Leo in the uh, chat. Thank you, Rena, for this inspiring presentation. I have a question about the development part of the concept of MDR. On page 40, you define MDR as the full set of immigration policies that accumulate states to ensure capital accumulation and political legitimacy. So development here has both economic and political dimensions. I'm wondering if these economic and political goals have their own inconsistencies and conflicts throughout history. If so, how such conflicts have created tensions for India's immigration policies. Hmm, I'm just trying to understand the question a little bit more. So, uh, oh, this is a hi. Hi, Toki. Um, maybe if you're here, can you just expand on the question a bit on what you mean by the tensions? 
Um, sure, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if these political political goals and economic goals um, conflict with each other. For example, in the Chinese mm. case, okay. um, during the uh, economic reforms, um, sometimes China wants to um, hold back their um, immigration opening because um, the state was worrying if um, these immigrants might pose a threat um, to um, the political stability of the regime. Um, so in the Chinese case, I can always see these tensions between um, economic and political goals behind immigration policies. I wonder if um, similar patterns occur in the Indian case as well. And uh, if that, that does occur, um, how that shapes an, an India's um, an MDR? Because um, in your framework, um, migration and development seems very interlinked, interlocked in this regime. Um, I wonder if there are an internal tensions. Yeah, okay, yeah, fantastic question. And actually this comes back a little bit to some of the question, underlying questions, Rohan, that you had. Um, so Rohan, you had mentioned that it's a puzzle, right? And this is the question I usually get. Why in the world would India prevent its poor workers from going and let its elite workers from going? One would uh, at first assume a sending country would do the opposite. It would keep its elite workers at home and keep its let its poor workers go. Um, and I, I think there's two answers to it for in the Indian case. One is material. So we have to understand India's second MDR, its nationalist MDR, very much in the post-colonial context, where there was this strong urge to show the world that we can be self-sufficient. And that was all fueled by this sort of you know, modernization view that we will industrialize, as you said, with capital intensive um, firms, but also quite labor intensive. At least that was the utopian vision that with this will be a, a labor intensive industrialization project, just like what worked for the West. And, um, and that means we need to keep the brawn at home. And so there was a materialist element, of course, as we all know, who study India, it didn't work out that way. It was not labor intensive. It, for a variety of reasons that I've written about elsewhere, India did not go, did not, you know, mod modernity didn't happen in that utopian way within India. Um, it, we retained a huge informal sector. We didn't retained a massive informal labor sphere that continued to fuel India's industrialization. Um, so part of that um, uh, was actually without tension, it made sense, but I would say a much bigger part was intention and in contradiction. And that was, again, very much spurred by this deep, deep, granted at the national level, deep commitment to saying we will not be a coolie nation. It's, and it's still very deeply entrenched in a lot of the rhetoric that the government makes today, even if it comes at the expense of economic rationality. We, we will maintain our image as a, uh, not yet a global superpower at that time, but at least a country that is shorn of colonialism and, and will not put our people out there to serve the, the foreigners. Now, coming back to the tensions of the CEO MDR, I mentioned earlier that one thing that's happening is that the elites are coming down to the poor emigrants level by being so insecure. Um, but the other thing that's ironically happening is that the one thing the Indian government vowed to never be, i.e. a non coolie nation, is precisely what the CEO MDR is turning itself back into, where it's in fact starting to look more and more like that coolie MDR once again, which ultimately didn't have as many political and economic tensions, partly because there was no politics about taking the high road. <laughs> um, so if as we start losing that high road, even in rhetoric, um, the tension is sort of disappearing and we are becoming a lot more like a coolie MDR where we are sending out racialized coolies that are extremely insecure and vulnerable to um, basically serve other countries. <laughs> 
Rena, I have another historical question, which I, I, I didn't see in the chapter. Maybe, maybe I missed it, but I didn't see it. And perhaps you might respond to it. And I think it's very relevant to this middle period where the you know, newly independent Indian government becomes the major international force behind the anti-apartheid movement from the very first meeting of the General Assembly. Um, and that's to protest the treatment of Indians in South Africa. And I wonder if if that's part of your story or how that plays into the other kinds of dynamics that you identify in that um, mid 20th century period. Yeah, so that's a complicated one again and laced with class inequity as well. Um, so other people have written um, really beautifully about this, but um, so there is a now a, a day to sort of celebrate the emigrants of India in, in India, and it's this big sort of festival where a lot of awards are given and blah, 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 and it's held on January 9th to mark the date that Gandhi, the greatest emigrant for India, you know, returned from South Africa to India. So the, the sort of um, that story is used to show, look at how much we actually have gained from our immigrants, which is which was a forced story because it was such a shift from the earlier mentality where we said, if you've left the country, you've left the project and you are not one of us anymore. And the idea to shift into now saying India actually has tentacles all over the world and all of you can be part of the nation, even if you're not part of the country, is a very new project. And so Gandhi was sort of this, the image of Gandhi was resurrected to sort of create consent for that new um, narrative. But others have noted that actually Gandhi was not really fighting for the rights of coolies or the poor in South Africa at first. Um, it was much more uh, a sort of a fight for the rights for the elite and professional elite Indians in South Africa. And only later, when it became sort of politically um, um, powerful, did were the coolies brought into it. So that was very much a part of, I, I don't know, I thought I mentioned a little bit of it in the book, um, but that that was very much a part of it. Now, once independence, this is you know, once India's independence did take place, there was a new conundrum that Nehru faced, the first prime minister of India faced, which was this commitment, again, um, sometimes contradictory, but a commitment to respecting sovereign borders. So this became a problem when other countries started having nationalist movements that expelled their Indian population, that to the earlier question had arrived there because of the Cooley MDR, um, and now we're in these other countries had been sort of assumed that they would get citizenship, but when these other countries got independence, there was nationalist movements to expel them. And there was a call to Indian, the Indian government to say, please protect the Indians. And Nehru was very explicit, we're not gonna interfere. Even though these are Indians, we are not gonna interfere with things that happen within other people's borders. Again, that post-colonial context had so much power um, at that moment that 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 complicated matters. Any other questions from the floor? Yeah, Rohan, go ahead. Yeah, I actually just want to ask one question. I was thinking about it, um, especially in the uh, Gulf case and with um, kind of like the political hegemony of Hindutva. Um, could you maybe say a little bit more about the religious aspect of all of this as, you know, um, you know there, there's obviously a history of, of Muslims emigrating as a way to um, escape uh, uh, social violence. Um, do you see this being reflected at the um, at the at the national level at all um, as the BJP sort of solidifies its political hegemony in India? Yeah, so this is being recorded, so I'm going to say this um, in diplomatic terms. But um, so you know, uh, in, so let me say this: um, 
So in my Indian American transnational organization inventory, um, the, the, I, the vast majority, the largest sub, I sort of categorize these organizations based on self-identities. And the largest category of organizations identified as religious organizations. And within that, a huge amount were Hindu uh, organizations. Um, and every single leader of these organizations, oh, I should have said also to Jennifer, by the way, this entire thing among the poor, as well as the elite, is very male dominated. So the entire, I already mentioned that the stream of migration going to the Gulf is very male, um, legally male, but the transnational activity that's happening among the elites in the US is very male dominated. So almost all those 620 some organizations were led by men and were largely male membership. Almost every single one of them, religious or not, that I spoke with said that they started that organization and all those efforts for one reason, one reason only, and that is to ensure that their children have an Indian identity. They were worried they're becoming too American, they had no connection to the India, and they wanted them to become more Indian. And that basically failed um, across all the organizations, except for among the Hindu organizations. And the Hindu organizations, I would argue, have been most successful at attracting multiple generations of the diaspora, including in American born Indians. And, you know, it really is Peggy Levitt's book, God Has No Passport, and the Indian government has invested, especially the BJP has done a very good job of investing in that narrative and saying, look, you don't have to be Indian. We understand you're American. In fact, we want you to stay American. We actually like your Americanness, unlike the previous um, governments. We like America. We like what America does. We like your values. We want to import your values, all of that. All we ask you to recognize is that India is the homeland of the Hindus. And so we want you to have that dual identity. And of course, the Indian government has not allowed full dual citizenship but as you know, probably wrong, they've allowed this sort of sub kind of dual identity, which is called a person of Indian origin. And again, in the beginning, at first, the countries that were allowed to apply for the, the emigrants in receiving countries, it was only certain receiving countries were allowed to apply for that person of Indian origin card. Um, only later did they include other countries like the Gulf, but the beginning countries were those countries where most of the elite Indians live, um, and those people were allowed to be um, allowed to apply for PIOs, which essentially give them all rights, many rights except voting, um, and even that is being contested at the moment. So. Um, there's a lot more to say on the Hindu side and the religious side, but I will just say that that is one aspect that has been extremely successful in terms of that building that elite pact, not just with the diaspora, but also the offspring of the NRIs, so the, the American-born diaspora, and that's been very powerful. Um, and I should also say on the Gulf side, it was, it is true that in the beginning, it was mainly a Muslim group that went there. But as the Gulf side has also changed its immigration policies to say, we actually don't want one religion from one ethnic group that speaks one religion, you know, language, we want it to be more diverse combined with what was going on in India, where it was creating We've read, we know a lot about how migrants come back to India, as in other countries, with a lot of opulent expenditure. And when that opulent expenditure was arriving only among a certain community, that was creating tension. So the government really invested in ensuring that not only one community goes abroad, that actually as many Hindus go. And as we know now, Kerala is not the largest sending state anymore. It's actually Hindu dominated states that are sending more migrants abroad. Um, I just want to, I see your hand, um, Jackie, just really quickly, I should have also mentioned to an earlier question, one of the things that I, um, someone had asked about this sort of, um, I forget who said this, but this sort of building consent on, oh, I think it was you, Ron, who mentioned um, uh, 
contradictory class locations, that migration is sort of creating these contradictory class locations, or at least valorizing this idea of entrepreneurship. And so one of the, another claim I'm making in the book is that poor migrants, which unlike the labor migrants that I earlier had studied for my previous work, poor migrants, I was really um, sort of struck to see that rather than organizing as workers, They've in fact much more organized in cross-class organizations that include elite migrants and sort of drunk the Kool-Aid or attained consent for these, um, this valorization of self-sufficiency, entrepreneurship, privatization. They do not want to be seen as workers. And when I spoke with the unions, and by the way, there are these unions of construction workers are this, you know, very similar to these poor migrants who are construction workers. But when I talked to the unions, they were saying, oh, you know, the migrants, they think they're better than us, but they're lazy and, and we, don't, we don't organize with them, et cetera. And I expected to go to the migrants and hear them say, oh, the, the unions think they're better than us. But they were like, no, we're better than them. We actually have a work ethic. We're more skilled. We're cosmopolitan. We've seen the world. So there's a real um, success I would say, in dividing the laboring class between migrants versus domestic labor. And these migrants are sort of aspiring and even organizing to be seen under a new identity, not a labor identity, but a migrant identity, that it's cross-class. Yeah, go ahead, Dajachi. Yeah, um, I'm very curious why India chose the years of schooling as um, the threshold mm. requirement for um, to to distinguish the poor um, um, from the rich, and on page seventy nine, um, it said um, the cut of a year of years ed education actually changed from twelve to ten um, in the nineteen eighties. Um, I wonder what's the reason behind it and how the Indian government chose. Um, um, education as the proxy for for class, because um, other countries may have a um, totally different um, proxies. In in China, it can be your political opinion, your a uh, diaspora background. I'm curious about um, this education factor in India. Well, it's such an interesting question because I've actually never been asked that before, and I had assumed I've never been asked that before because. I assume that was the norm in most countries. So Natasha Iskander and I have actually been working on, on the use of skill um, as a differentiating point in migration more than in domestic labor markets. Um, but I'm fascinated to hear that you're surprised by that. So I will just say in my mind, and I would say from an Indian perspective, um, skill becomes this sort of legitimate way to differentiate class. And as I said at the start, the migration state has this uncontested right to uh, distinguish and discriminate migrants based on class. But one cannot say overtly that we're going to discriminate on poor people versus wealthy people, although some receiving countries do. They say if you have this much assets, you can come in, and if you don't, you don't. But in the Indian case, the sort of more legitimate way of distinguishing people is on skill. And one could argue that skill is an equalizing force, that everyone has the right to go get educated. Um, but as we know, the reality is the reality and the vast majority of the poor are not able to make it to 12th education. The move from 12th to 10th was an interesting one because that was an effort to sort of liberalize. And that was a move to sort of say, okay, let's allow a bigger percentage of our population to legally emigrate. Um, so the bar for what is skill versus unskilled was shifted. And for those of you who've read Natasha's beautiful book, we know skill is a social construction. There's no reality to it. So the idea is how are we going to justify and socially, uh, socially construct this delineation between who has the right to mobility and who doesn't. And in the Indian case, skill became something that had a lot of legitimacy, partly because the assumption was you're not born into it. 
So I just have a question for you. Is that not how it is um, in your experience in China? Is skill not used at all to distinguish immigrants? It's used, um, but I don't think the Chinese government perceives it of, um, as a very useful requirement uh, or threshold because um, in the 80s and 90s, um, if you want to go abroad and, and as a cook, um, the Chinese government would require you to produce um, uh, some certificate for the cooking training. And, and these Chinese migrants that interviewed, they would simply contact these cooking uh, schools in China and ask them to produce a certificate um, based on their three days of training. So um, if you really want, um, want us to, to show some, um, some certificate, it can be easily faked. Um, the government has no control over these um, um, training schools. So um, what, what, what they do have control is um, their uh, political files. They can check on um, if you have said anything, if you have gone on protests. Um, um, yeah, that's why I find um, these um, cutoff years and um, um, education as proxy for class very interesting. Well, what you just said um, made me realize, first of all, I think what you just described is the direction India is going in. So in 2019, there was a reform proposed on the immigration bill that's that's trying to get rid of that cutoff line. Of course, it's sat tabled, it hasn't passed because there still is this resistance to it. And the resistance really does, or this um, holding on to education is does come back to that um, modernization kind of utopian um, vision that we will become a developed nation, a modern nation, and education will be our pathway to modernity. Um, so again, holding on to that non cooly nation means anyone who hasn't been enlightened with these number of years of formal training is going to be deemed vulnerable and it is the state's job to protect them. Protect them from what? Protect them from the West. By the way, this is all happening when there's deep, deep capitalist exploitation by Indian capitalists. But having that exploitation done by foreign capitalists was something that the post-colonial government um, wouldn't agree to. Although, like I said, we're, we're moving in a different direction where we're sort of coming back to something that looks a lot more similar to the CEO MDR. I mean, sorry, the Cooley MDR. <laughs> well, we are at time, but I want to, uh, again, thank you very much, Rina, for presenting your book. Congratulate you for the Thomas and Znanetsky Award. Also, we're very appreciative of uh, Rohan joining us with his comments and uh, look forward to seeing you at our next events. Thank you so much. Thank you for these great questions too. It made me think of new things. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rohan.